This is a lecture on genetic disorders with specific focus on chromosomal disorders, single gene disorders, and molecular genetic diagnosis. The objectives of this lecture is to describe the genetic basis of the common chromosomal disorders and their clinical presentation, to describe the genetic basis of the common single gene disorders and their clinical presentations, and to discuss the recent and relevant molecular diagnostic tests and modalities, including their clinical applications. So our first topic would be the chromosomal disorders. The human somatic cells contain 46 chromosomes, 22 homologous pairs of autosomes, and two sex chromosomes, XX in the female and XY in the male. The study of chromosomes is called karyotyping and is the basic tool in cytogenetic studies. The usual procedure is to examine chromosome is to arrest the dividing cells in metaphase with mitotic spindle inhibitor, such as your N-diacetyl, N-methyl colchicine, and then to stain the chromosomes. In a metaphase spread, the individual chromosomes take the form of two chromatids connected at the centromere. A karyotype is obtained by arranging each pair of autosomes according to length followed by sex chromosomes. A variety of seeding methods have been developed that allow identification of individual chromosomes on the basis of distinctive and reliable patterns of alternating light and dark bands. The one most commonly used involves a gymsystein and hence called also the G-banding. With your standard G-banding, approximately 400 to 800 bands per haploid set can be detected with an average of about 500 bands per haploid. So again, just to emphasize that in a metaphase spread, the individual chromosomes take the form of two chromatids connected at the centromere. Your karyotype, therefore, is a standard arrangement of a photograph stained chromosome pair, which are arranged in order of decreasing length. What are the clinical utility of karyotype analysis? It is used to identify genotypic sex, such as identification of X and Y chromosomes, to identify ploidy, whether it's euploid, aneuploid, or polyploid, and also to identify chromosomal structural defects such as translocation, isochromosome, deletion, and others, which I will discuss in the succeeding slides. Shown here is your G-banded karyotype from a normal male, and also shown is the banding pattern of the X chromosomes with nomenclature of the arms, regions, bands, and subbands. Also shown here is the X chromosomes with some of the more common chromosomal disorders and their specific locations in the different region of the chromosomes. This is a comparison of the karyotype of your normal female versus a normal male. So karyotypes are usually described using a shorthand system of notations in the following order. First is the total number of chromosomes followed by the sex chromosome complement and third is a description of abnormalities in ascending numerical order. So for example, a male with a trisomy 21 is designated as 47XY plus 21. Now notations denoting structural alterations of chromosomes and their corresponding abnormalities will be described later in the lecture. Let's review some of the cytogenetic terminology. So the short arm of a chromosome is designated as P for petite, and the long arm is referred to as the Q, which is the next letter of the alphabet. So each chromosome is divided into two or more regions. Each region is subdivided into bands and subbands. So as I mentioned earlier, the total number of chromosomes is given first, followed by sex chromosomes, and finally, the description of abnormality in ascending order. So again, 
the short arm of a chromosome is designated as P for petit, and the long arm is referred to as the Q. In the banded karyotype, each arm of the chromosome is divided into two or more regions bordered by prominent bands. The regions are numbered 1, 2, or 3 from the centromere outward. Each region is further subdivided into bands and subbands, and these are numbered numerically as well. So it's very important to remember this chromosome nomenclature. Let's go to the structural abnormalities of the chromosomes. The aberration underlying cytogenetic disorder may take either the abnormal number of chromosomes or alteration in the structures of one or more chromosomes. So before we proceed, let's review some of the concepts related to the structural abnormalities of the chromosomes. So the normal human karyotype, the somatic cells has 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. So that is 46XX for, for female or 46XY for male. The normal karyotype is deployed, meaning there are two copies of each chromosomes, but the sperm and eggs carry 23 chromosomes and are haploid because there's only one copy of each chromosomes. So some more definitions as we proceed with the lecture. So haploid refers to a single set of chromosomes, which is 23 in human, which is only found in sperm and eggs, and thus haploid. Your diploid refers to a double set of chromosomes, which is uh, 46 in humans, so somatic cells are diploid. And euploid refers to any multiple of the haploid set of chromosomes, so meaning haploid number of chromosomes is 23. So a polyploid refers to any multiple of the haploid set of chromosomes, and aneuploid refers to karyotypes that do not have multiples of the haploid set of chromosomes, while monosomy refers to an aneuploid karyotype with one missing chromosome, and trisomy refers to an aneuploid karyotype with one extra chromosome. Uh, the best example here is your trisomy 21 in Down syndrome. And then we have three classes of chromosome according to the location of the centromere. So we have the metacentric, meaning the centromere is in the middle. Submetacentric, the centromere is distant from the middle. And acrocentric, the centromere is at the end. If an error occurs in meiosis or mitosis, and a cell acquires a chromosome complement that is not an exact multiple of 23, it is called aneuploidy. The usual causes for aneuploidy are non-disjunctions and anaphase lag. So for comparison, this is the normal sequence in your normal meiosis. When non-disjunction occurs during gametogenesis, the gametes form have either an extra chromosome or one less chromosome. So fertilization of such gametes by normal gametes result in two types of zygotes. You have a trisomic or monosomic. So what are the six main types of structural abnormalities of the chromosomes? So we have deletions, we have the ring chromosome, duplication, isochromosome, inversion, which can be paracentric or pericentric, and we have translocation, which could be Robertsonian or reciprocal. So first is deletion. Deletion refers to loss of a portion of a chromosome. So it results in monosomy of that chromosomal segment. So usually the clinical effects due to insufficient gene product or unmasking of mutant alleles on normal chromosomes. So we have two types of deletions. We have terminal and interstitial. Most deletions are interstitial, but rarely terminal deletions may occur. Interstitial deletions occur when there are two breaks within a chromosome arm followed by loss of the chromosomal material between the breaks and fusion of the broken ends. 
while terminal deletions result from a single break in a chromosome arm producing a fragment with no centromere which is then lost at the next cell division. The deleted end of the retained chromosome is protected by acquiring the telomeric sequences. A ring chromosome is a special form of deletion. It is produced when a break occurs at both ends of a chromosome with fusion of the damaged end. If significant genetic material is lost, phenotypic abnormalities result. So ring chromosomes do not behave normally in meiosis or mitosis and usually result in serious consequences. What about duplication? Duplication is a mutation of a chromosome producing an extra copy of all or part of a chromosome. While inversion refers to a rearrangement that involves two breaks within a single chromosome with reincorporation of the inverted intervening segment. An inversion involving only one arm of the chromosome is known as paracentric. If the breaks are on opposite sides of the centromere, it is called pericentric. Inversions are often fully compatible with normal development. An isochromosome Formation result when one arm of a chromosome is lost and the remaining arm is duplicated, resulting in a chromosome consisting of two short arms only or of two long arms. An isochromosome has morphologically identical genetic information in both arms. So the most common isochromosome present in live births involve the long arm of the X chromosomes. So what about translocation? So translocation is the exchange of chromosomal material between two or more chromosomes. In short, a segment of one chromosome is transferred to another. We have two types. We have the reciprocal and the Robertsonian. Basically, if no essential chromosome material lost or genes damaged, then the individual is clinically normal. However, there is an increased chance of chromosomally unbalanced offspring. Now, in reciprocal translocation, there are single breaks in each of the two chromosomes with exchange of material. Because there has been no or very little loss of genetic material, the individual here is likely to be phenotypically normal. A balanced translocation carrier, however, is at an increased risk for produ producing abnormal gametes. The other type is the Robertsonian translocation, named after W. R. B. Robertson, who first identified them in grasshoppers. It is the most common structural chromosome abnormality in humans, about 1 in 1,000 live births, and it involves two acrocentric chromosomes. And we have two subtypes, we have the homologous acrocentrics and non-homologous acrocentrics. In Robertsonian translocation, typically the breaks occur close to the centromeres of each chromosome. Transfer of the segments then leads to one very large chromosome and one extremely small one. Usually the small product is lost, however, because it carries only highly redundant genes like ribosomal RNA genes, this loss is compatible with a normal phenotype. And this is to illustrate the difference between your homologous acrocentric and non-homologous acrocentric. Now let's go to the common cytogenetic diseases. From the autosomes, I will dis discuss the trisomy 21 or the Down syndrome and we'll briefly mention about the Patau and Edwards, as well as the 22Q11.2 deletions, and the sex chromosomes from the Kleinfelter and the Turner syndrome. First is the cytogenetic disorders involving autosomes. So trisomy 21, or the Down syndrome, is the most common of the chromosomal disorders, and is a major cause of intellectual disability. 
As mentioned earlier, the most common cause of trisomy and therefore of Down syndrome is meiotic non disjunction. So the parents of such children have a normal karyotype and are normal in all respect. Maternal age has a strong influence on the incidence of trisomy 21 and in about 4% of cases of Down syndrome, the extra chromosomal material derives from the presence of a Robertsonian translocation of the long arm of chromosome 21 to another acrocentric chromosome, such as chromosome 22 or 14. Also, approximately 1% of patients with Down syndrome are mosaics having a mixture of cells with 46 or 47 chromosomes. The diagnostic clinical features of these conditions are flat facial profile, oblique palpebral fissures, and epicantic folds which are usually readily evident even at birth. So Down syndrome is a leading cause of severe intellectual disability. It should be pointed out that some mosaics with Down syndrome have mild phenotypic changes and may even have a normal or near normal intelligence. But in addition to the phenotypic abnormalities and the intellectual disability, some other clinical features are noted. So approximately 40% of the patient have congenital heart disease. The most frequent of these are your atrial ventricular septal defects, constituting 43%. Um, it can also be ventricular septal defects atrial septal defects, and tetralogy of fallow. Also, children with trisomy 21 have a high risk of developing leukemia, and virtually all patients with trisomy 21 older than age 40 develop neuropathologic changes characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Also, patients with Down syndrome have abnormal immune responses that predispose them to serious infections particularly of the lungs and the thyroid autoimmunity. In a nutshell, in trisomy 21 or the Down syndrome, most trisomies are from maternal non-disjunctions. It is the number one cause of mental retardation. It is maternal age related, usually at very high risk for mother above 45 years of age and it is associated with congenital heart defects, risk for acute leukemias, and GI atresia. So this is the fluorescence in cytohybridization analysis of an interface nucleus using the local specific probes to chromosome 13 and chromosome 21. So it reveals here that three red signals are revealing the extra copy consistent with trisomy 21. Other trisomies that we can mention here are we have the trisomy 18 or the Edward syndrome and trisomy 13 or the Patau syndrome. So um, as mentioned earlier, they share also several karyotypic and clinical features with trisomy 21. Thus, most cases result from meiotic non-disjunctions and therefore carry a complete extra copy of chromosome 13 or 18. So as in Down syndrome, an association with increased maternal age is also noted. In contrast to trisomy 21, however, the malformations are much more severe and wide-ranging. As a result, only rarely do infants survive beyond the first year of life? So most succumb within a few weeks to a few months. Another chromosomal disorder is the so-called chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. This syndrome encompasses a spectrum of disorders that result from a small deletion of band Q11.2 on the long arm of chromosome 22. Now the syndrome is fairly common occurring in as many as 1 in 4,000 births. But it's often missed because of variable clinical features like your congenital heart defects, abnormalities of the palate, facial dysmorphism, developmental delay, and variable degrees 
of T-cell immunodeficiency as well as hypocalcemia. Now previously, these clinical features were considered to represent two different disorders, the Dichuard syndrome and the velocardiofacial syndrome. Patients with Dichuard syndrome have thymic hypoplasia with resultant T-cell immunodeficiency, um, also parathyroid hypoplasia, giving rise to hypocalcemia, a variety of cardiac malformations affecting the outflow tract and mild facial anomalies. Um, also, atopic disorders and autoimmunity may also be seen. While the clinical features of the so-called velocardiofacial syndrome include facial dysmorphism, like prominent nose, retrognathia, cleft palate, cardiovascular anomalies, and learning disabilities. Less frequently, this patient also have immunodeficiency. So this is the FISH studies of both metaphase chromosomes and an interphase cell from a patient with the Chouard syndrome, demonstrating the deletion of a probe that maps to chromosome 22Q11.2. Now let's go to the cytogenetic disorders involving sex chromosomes. Now the sex chromosome disorders are more common than the autosomes. Let's review some of the concepts. So these are problems related to sexual development and fertility. Usually these disorders are discovered at the time of puberty and then the retardation is related to the number of X chromosomes. Also, if you have at least one Y chromosomes, you are a male. Now let's go to Klinefelter syndrome or XXY or XXXY. Now Klinefelter syndrome is defined as male hypogonadism that occurs when there are two or more X chromosomes and one or more Y chromosomes. It is actually one of the most frequent forms of genetic diseases involving the sex chromosomes as well as one of the most common causes of hypogonadism in male. Now the clinical features of Klinefelter syndrome can be attributed to two major factors. First, it is the aneuploidy and the impact of increased gene dosage by the supernumerary X and the second one is the presence of hypogonadism. Now this syndrome is rarely diagnosed before puberty, particularly because manifestation of hypogonadism do not develop before early puberty. So most patients have a distinctive body habitus with an increase in length between the soles and the pubic bone, which creates the appearance of an elongated body. Also characteristic are unicoid uh, body habitus with abnormally long legs, small atrophic testis, often associated with a small penis, and a lack of such secondary male characteristic as uh, deep voice, the bird, and male distribution of pubic hair. Gynecomastia may be present. So the cognitive abilities range from average to below average with modest deficit in verbal skills particularly those that are used in reading and language comprehension. Now, patients with Klinefelter syndrome develop other comorbid conditions, like there's an increased incidence of type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome that gives rise to insulin resistance. Patients are also at risk for congenital heart disease like mitral valve prolapse, um, also atrial and ventricular septal defects, there's also increased risk of osteoporosis and fractures due to hormonal imbalance. And uh, there is also 20 to 30 higher risk of developing extra gonadal germ cell tumors, mostly magistinal teratomas. Also, Klinefelter syndrome is an important genetic cause of reduced spermatogenesis and male infertility. Now, Turner syndrome or XO. So, Turner syndrome results from complete or partial monosomy of the X chromosome and is characterized by 
hypogonadism in phenotypic females. Turner syndrome is the most common sex chromosome abnormality in females, affecting about 1 in 2,000 live-born females. In genetic studies, about three types of karyotypic abnormalities are seen in this individual. About 57% are missing an entire X chromosome, resulting in a 45X karyotype. The common feature of the structural abnormalities is to produce partial monosomy of the X chromosome. The mosaic patients have a 45X cell population along with one or more karyotypically normal or abnormal cell types. So the most severely affected patient generally present during infancy with edema of the dorsum of the hand and foot due to limb stasis and sometimes swelling of the nape of the neck. Now, as these infants develop, the swelling subside but often leave bilateral neck webbing and persistent looseness of skin on the back of the neck. So congenital heart disease is also common, affecting up to half of patients. These include left-sided cardiovascular abnormalities, particularly preductal coarctation of the aorta, bicuspid aortic valve, and approximately about 5% are diagnosed with coarctation of aorta. Aortic root dilatation is also present in 30% of cases, and there is about a hundredfold increased risk of aortic dissection. Now, at puberty, there is a failure to develop normal secondary sex characteristic. The genitalia remain infantile, breast development is inadequate, and there is little pubic hair. The mental status of this patient is usually normal, but subtle defects in nonverbal, visual, spatial information processing have been noted. A particular importance in establishing the diagnosis in an adult is the shortness of stature. They rarely exceed 150 cm in, in height and amenorrhea. So it is important to remember that Turner syndrome is the single most important cause of primary amenorrhea. So again, showing to you the typical characteristic of Turner syndrome. So what about hermaphroditism and pseudohermaphroditism? So these are some of the important concepts. So genetic sex is determined by the presence or absence of a Y chromosome, but there's also the so-called gonadal or your phenotypic and ductal sex. So a true hermaphrodite is when ovaries and testes often on opposite sides present. It is very rare. A pseudohermaphrodite is a male when testes with female characteristic and of XY, while female ovaries with male characteristic and XX. Now let's go to the second topic which is a single gene disorders with non-classic inheritance. So these are single gene disorders wherein the transmission does not follow the classic Mendelian principles. So these group of disorders can be classified into four categories. The first one is disorders caused by trinucleotide repeat mutations, disorders by mutations in mitochondrial genes, disorders associated with genomic imprinting, and disorders associated with gonadal mosaic systems. So disorders caused by trinucleotide repeat mutations. Now the expansion of trinucleotide repeats is an important genetic cost of human disease particularly neurodegenerative disorders. So in 1991, the discovery of the expanding trinucleotide repeats as a cause of fragile X syndrome was actually a landmark in human genetics. And since then, uh, they discovered the origins of about 40 more human diseases, like in this um, graph or photo. Um, so some of the more common principles are the 
common principles associated with this disease are now the, the cause of mutations are associated with the expansion of a stretch of trinucleotide that usually share the nucleotides G and C. So in all cases, the DNA is unstable and an expansion of the repeats above a certain threshold impairs gene functions in various ways. Now, there are three key mechanisms by which unstable repeats cause diseases. The first one is the loss of function of the affected gene, typically by transcription silencing, as in fragile X syndrome. In such cases, the repeats are generally in the non-coding part of the gene. The second mechanism is a toxic gain of function by alterations of protein structure as in Huntington disease and spinal cerebellar ataxias. Now, in such cases, the expansions occur in the coding regions of the genes. Now, the third mechanism is a toxic gain of function mediated by RNA as is seen in fragile X associated tremor or ataxia syndrome as in fragile X syndrome. The non-coding parts of the gene are affected. So the morphologic hallmark of these diseases is the accumulation of aggregated mutant proteins in large intranuclear inclusions. So the best disease studied under this category is a fragile X syndrome, which is the most common genetic cause of intellectual disability in males, and overall the second most common cause after Down syndrome. Now it results from a trinucleotide expansion mutation in the familial mental retardation 1 gene or FMR1 gene. Now male with fragile X syndrome have marked intellectual disability. They have a characteristic physical phenotype that includes a long face with a large mandible large everted ears and large testicles or macroorchidism, hyperextensible joint, a high arch palate, and mitral valve prolapse noted in some patient mimic connective tissue disorder. These and other physical abnormalities described in this condition, however, are not always present and in some cases are quite subtle. The most distinctive feature here is your macroorchidism which is observed in at least 90% of affected post-pubertal males. Now, as with other X-linked diseases, fragile X syndrome affects male predominantly. Analysis of several pedigrees, however, reveals some patterns of transmission not typically associated with other X-linked recessive disorders. So the carrier males, approximately 20% of males, who by pedigree analysis and by molecular tests are known to carry a fragile X mutations and they are clinically normal. So because carrier males transmit the trait through all their phenotypically normal daughters to affected grandchildren, they are called normal transmitting males. How about affected females? 30 to 50% of carrier females are affected, a number much higher than that in other X-linked recessive disorders. The risk of phenotypic effects. Risk depends on the position of the individual in the pedigree. So for example, the brothers of transmitting males are at a 9% risk of having intellectual disability, whereas grandson of transmitting males incur a 40% risk. How about anticipation? Now, this refers to the observation that the clinical features of FXS worsen with each successive generation, as if the mutation becomes increasingly deleterious as it is transmitted from a man to his grandsons and great-grandsons. The molecular basis of intellectual disability and other somatic changes is related to loss of function of the fragile X mental retardation protein, or FMRP, which is the product of your FMR1 gene. 
So FMRP is a widely expressed cytoplasmic protein most abundant in the brain and testis, which is or which are the two organs most affected in this disease. The, propo the proposed functions in the brain are the following. So FR FMRP selectively binds mRNAs associated with polysomes and regulate their inter or intracellular transport to dendrites, and it can also be a translation regulator as well. Next is the disorders by mutation in mitochondrial genes best exemplified by your Leber hereditary optic neuropathy. So diseases associated with mitochondrial inheritance are rare actually, and many of them affect the neuromuscular system. Leber hereditary optic neuropathy is a prototype of this disorder. So this is a neurodegenerative disease that manifests as progressive bilateral loss of central vision. Now, visual impairment is first noted between ages 15 and 35 and eventually leading to blindness. Cardiac conduction defects and minor neurologic manifestation have also been observed in some families. So what about disorders associated with genomic imprinting? So imprinting involves transcriptional silencing of the paternal or maternal copies of certain genes during gametogenesis. So for such genes, only one functional copy exists in the individual. So loss of the functional allele by deletions give rise to diseases. In Prader-Willi syndrome, there is deletion of band Q12 on the long arm of paternal chromosome 15. So genes in this region of maternal chromosome 15 are imprinted so there is complete loss of their functions. So in Prader-Willi syndrome, patients have intellectual disability, short stature, hypotonia, hyperphagia, small hands and feet, and hypogonadism. In Angelman syndrome, there is deletion of the same region from the maternal chromosome, and genes on the corresponding region of paternal chromosome 15 are imprinted. So this patient have intellectual disability, ataxia, seizures, and inappropriate laughter. How about disorders associated with gonadal mosaic system? So in every autosomal dominant disorder, some patients do not have affected parents. Now in those patients, the disorder result from a new mutation in the egg or the sperm from which they were derived. So as such, their siblings are neither affected nor at increased risk for development of the disease. This is not always the case, however. So in some autosomal dominant disorders exemplified by osteogenesis imperfecta, phenotypically normal parents have more than one affected child, and this clearly violates the law of Mendelian inheritance. So studies indicate that gonadal mosaic system may be responsible for such unusual pedigrees. So again, this is a summary of the single gene disorders with non-classic inheritance. Your involvement of the triple repeats, mitochondrial mutations, genomic imprinting, and gonadal mosaic system. The third and last part of this lecture is your molecular genetic diagnosis. So, what are the applications of your molecular genetic diagnosis? Well, it can identify birth defects, which are both prenatal or postnatal, identify your tumor cells. It is also used in the classification of the different types of tumors, the identification of pathogens, such as your um, SARS-CoV-2, your donor compatibility, paternity, forensics, and tumor DNA in the blood. So the first of this diagnostic is your PCR and detection of DNA sequence alterations. So PCR analysis involves synthesis of relatively short DNA fragments from a DNA template and has been a mainstay of molecular diagnostic for the last decades. So by using an appropriate 
a heat stable DNA polymerases and thermal cycling, the target DNA lying between the signed primary site is exponentially amplified from as little as one original copy. So by that, it, it can greatly simplifying or it can greatly simplify the secondary sequence analysis, which can be one of the following. Your Sanger sequencing, you can also have your next generation sequencing, you have the single base primer extension, the restriction fragment length analysis, you have also have the amplicon length analysis, and your real-time PCR. So this is to show how PCR analysis can be used to detect mutation in fragile X syndrome. So two primers that flank the region containing the trinucleotide repeats at the five prime ends of the FMR1 genes are used to amplify the intervening sequences. And this is very important to detect your mutations. Next is molecular analysis of genomic alterations. So a significant number of genetic lesions involve large deletions. Uh, or duplications or even more complex rearrangement and these are not readily amenable to detection using your PCR or DNA sequencing approaches. So such genomic scale alterations can be studied using a variety of hybridization based techniques. So one of this is your fluorescent in situ hybridization which uses DNA probes that recognize sequences specific to a particular chromosomal region. FISH can also be performed on prenatal samples, peripheral blood cells, touch preparation from cancer biopsies, and even fixed archival tissue section. So it is used to detect numeric abnormalities of chromosomes, subtle microdeletions, and even in spectral karyotyping. So FISH requires prior knowledge of one of the few specific chromosomal regions suspected of being altered in the test samples. However, genomic abnormalities can also be detected without prior knowledge by using microarray technology to perform a global genomic survey. So first generation platforms were designed for comparative genomic hybridization while newer platforms incorporate single nucleotide polymorphism genotyping approaches and this can offer uh, multiple benefits in the testing. How about polymorphic markers and molecular diagnosis? So the clinical detection of disease-specific mutation is possible only if the gene responsible for a disorder is known and its sequence has been identified. Now, if the exact nature of the genetic aberration is not known or if testing for the primary defect is technically challenging or unfeasible, the diagnostic laboratories can take advantage of the phenomenon of linkage. So the two types of genetic polymorphisms most useful for linkage analysis are your SNPs and the repeat polymorphisms known as minisatellite and microsatellite repeats. So assay to detect genetic polymorphism are also important in many other areas of medicine, including in the determination of relatedness and identity in transplantation, in cancer genetics, paternity testing, and forensic medicine. So what about testing for epigenetic alteration? So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is defined as a study of heritable chemical modification of DNA or chromatin that does not alter the protein encoding DNA sequence itself. So examples of such modifications include methylation of your DNA and methylation and acetylation of histones. So our understanding of the importance of these types of molecular alteration is rapidly growing and it is clear that epigenetic modification are critical for normal human development. Now there are special techniques needed to detect uh, DNA methylations and um, these are beyond the scope of this lecture. 
So how about RNA analysis? So the most important applications of RNA analysis are the detection and quantification of RNA viruses such as HIV, hepatitis C virus, and of course, the virus uh, causing this current outbreak. But also increasingly, RNA analysis is also being used to evaluate cancer. So mRNA expression profiling has become an important tool for molecular stratification of certain tumors. So most of you have probably heard about the next generation sequencing. So next generation sequencing actually is a term used to describe several newer DNA sequencing technologies that produce very large amounts of sequence data in a massively parallel manners. So actually these technologies have revolutionized biomedical research and are increasingly impacting molecular diagnostics. Now, the factors propelling rapid adoption of next-generation sequencing are the price and performance. So currently, NGS allows us to perform previously impossible analysis at extremely low relative cost. So basically, these are the technologies involved. Um, we have the sp spatial separation local amplification and parallel sequencing. So what are the, the usual application of your next generation sequencing? So each NGS analysis generates a staggering amount of sequence data. So this is very, this technology is very important in bio, bioinformatics, especially in areas of alignment, variant calling, variant annotation and interpretation, as well as mutational signature calling. Now, in terms of the clinical applications, the NGS has different has, or have different approaches as well and different applications, such, such as the targeted sequencing, wherein targeted NGS with gene panel is now a common place in evaluating individuals with genetic diseases such as your cardiomyopathy and congenital deafness. Now in cancer testing, gene panels are widely used to perform detailed tumor profiling. The other one is the whole exome sequencing. Now it is used in oncology to perform a very broad analysis, mostly in the research setting and also the whole genome sequencing, which is the only form of NGS that can detect novel structural rearrangements, such as your insertions, deletions, translocation that may be clinically relevant. Additionally, next generation sequencing has great promise for clinical applications in a number of other areas, including microbiome analysis, blood screening for early markers of diseases such as cancer and vastly more sensitive methods of gauging the response of cancers to therapy such as using the circulating free DNA release from tumor cells that is harvested from the blood. That's the end of this lecture. Thank you.